get out, only there was no door. I was basically the wall of the airplane was missing, and I'm just shooting out the side of the cabin. And... Well, still on the topic of money, in order to produce a film, you have to have, there. there's expenses involved. You've got to be able to pay for it. So, no. as you're... Wow, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. I'm your host, Jeffrey Hill, and today I really feel blessed. It is a special privilege today for me to introduce you to a man who I have followed on Facebook for many years. His name is Scott Wegener. He is a five times, see that's like five fingers on this hand and five fingers on this hand too because I still have all ten fingers. He is a five time any Emmy award winning producer. How often in your life do you get to spend a moment with someone who has earned this many quality awards for the work he's done? He's legendary. If you have anything to do with film or television, the name Scott Wegener is a name you should all know about. And so I want you to meet him in just a second, right after a movie of the moment. Poof. I tell people my sister moved out west. You're a science teacher. Your husband, he renovates houses. You're thinking about moving, but you're gonna wait until the interest rates go down. That's not my story. <laughs> Before I was an Avenger, I made mistakes. And a lot of enemies. He's called Science Taskmaster. He controls the Red Room. They're manipulated, fully conscious, but no choices. I should have come back for you. How many others are there? Enough. We have to go back to where it all started. So they never do that to anyone again. We're a family. We fight with you. You won't win. I've always found it best. Not to look into the past. Okay, you got a plan or shall I just stay duck and cover? My plan was to drive us away. Well, your plan sucks. At some point, we all have to choose between what the world wants you to be and who you are. I made my choice. I'm done running. Here's what's gonna happen. Natasha, don't slouch. I'm not slouching. You're going to get the back hunch. Mm, listen to your mother. Oh my God, this- Up, up, listen. All right, enough, all of you. I didn't say anything. That's not fair. Welcome, welcome to the show. Folks, for me, this is a big day. And I thought, how can I do this? Should I do it like all super snazzy? Or should I just get down, take my shoes off, and hang out with Scott Wagner? So today I took my super shiny shoes off. These are my favorite shoes. They're super shiny. I love black patent leather. So I took my super shiny shoes off so I could talk to Scott right here on the screen. Say hi to Scott. Hey there, Scott. Hey there. I am so glad to see you today. Now that I'm all comfy with no shoes on, I'm going to sit in my chair and just talk to you because how often do you get to talk to somebody who has won this many quality awards? You know, you get an award for filmmaking in some uh, film festival you've never heard about and, when we, and you, talk, you talk about it, you're like, whoa, I got an award in a film festival. But to get an official Emmy and not just 
one, but five, this makes you a legend. That's, that's why I've followed you for years. I've, I've seen your posts Appreciate. in Facebook, in filmmaker groups, in broadcast TV groups, in groups and groups on groups. Folks, it took us three months to get Scott to come on the show. He's an incredibly busy man. So today I'm looking forward to some nuggets. I want to hear Scott. Don't disappoint. What, <laughs> don't disappoint. No, I don't think there's going to be any problem with that. We're going to be not disappointed. We're going to be very, very glad. So you, you, where did, you, you know, obviously you're, well, like me, the spring chickens, they were a, a few years back. You have experience in the filmmaking and the TV world that goes for decades. It literally spans decades. But what That's was true. it that got you that way? 40, 30 years ago, what was that spark? Actually, it was more than 30 years ago. It was actually over 50 years ago. Um, it was one of those uh, happenstance moments. Uh, as a kid, I was 15 years old. And my parents got me a plastic wind-up brownie fun saver eight millimeter movie camera for my birthday. And I went and I shot a little movie in my backyard with my dad and a plastic flying saucer I bought at the hobby store. And I showed it at my brother's youth group, uh, and they loved it. They they cheered, they clapped, and this was my older brother's youth group. So these were older kids. Within five seconds of turning off the projector, I decided I'm doing this for the rest of my life. This is it. And I never looked back. I've been, you know, passionately making films ever since because I just love that rush of being able to entertain people. Now, back in those years, were there film schools or literally you learned off the seat of your pants? Yeah. Uh, no, there was film schools. Uh, I went to San Francisco State, uh, the cinema department, which had started just a few years prior to that, um, and actually developed a special major between San Francisco State and another university uh, that uh, to kind uh, several different uh, educational philosophies that these universities had uh, to build my own special major in theatrical film production. Uh, and uh, have been doing my own research and making my own films and a lot of seat of the pants after uh, to you know get the career going. What do you think would have happened if you hadn't attended film school? I'd probably be I don't know a librarian somewhere, a veterinarian, <laughs> or I don't know. I, I have no I have absolutely no idea what would have happened to me had I not gotten into filmmaking. I really have, I've never thought about it. Well, to me, that was one of the very first questions, because it's a question that, you know, I know you've seen this question in the filmmaker groups. Do I really need to attend film school? Is it worth the money? You just answered that question it, right there. Yeah, well, it, it depends what you want in filmmaking. Um, it's the, the value that you get in an education, in filmmaking education in, in college, is great. You learn history, you learn aesthetics, you learn film theory, uh, you learn by watching and being and having the instructors tell you the backstories of how movies were made, why they were made, what the aesthetics and all that is, um, which is very, very valuable. Um, but there are a lot of folks who just, you know, want to pick up a camera and learn it from themselves. And sometimes they're successful and sometimes they're not. Depends what uh, the end goal is. If you want to uh, get into the industry, um, then uh, going to film school is very helpful because not just for the subject matter, but you get to have tips and work alongside established directors in Hollywood or elsewhere. Uh, who can maybe pick you up as an intern and groom you and then get you into the system. I was never interested in that. I wanted uh, to always to strike out on my own, uh, kind of, in, in, which is sort of the same thing as community theater. I never wanted to be tied down to having to make money with films. 
uh, because then you start having to change your creative vision to meet a box office demand or the investor's demand or any of that, you know, of, hey, I'll give you a million dollars, but I want my sister-in-law in a sex scene with Tom Cruise. Uh, make that happen and I'll give you the money. I, I didn't want to have to deal with those kinds of uh, conflicts. And so I was all about, let's find a way through networking and uh, who you know and what imagination you can bring to a project to be able to make films with literally no money. And all the Emmy Awards that I've won have been for films that literally cost zero dollars to make. Incredible. During, during your 40 year long career, or 50 years really, you said 50. 50 years, yeah. I, I, I keep thinking we're the same age. <laughs> you're, <laughs> a, you're a little bit older than me. That's Not much. Tech. Not much, maybe, I don't know how many. During this, <laughs> were, were you, um, man, I know you have a regular day job working for a, te a television production company somewhere. But during the last 50 years, I'm assuming you also freelanced and hired crews of your own at times, right? No, nope, never did. Oh, really? Um, You've always been... Any... Yeah, I've always been making films and, you know, I'll put together my own crew, uh -huh. uh, but nobody's ever hired. It's always, you know, they're volunteering. And okay. the, the, the way I work that is uh, we always have the films be connected to a charity of some kind. And I always tell people up front, if the movie makes money, we're giving it away to a charity. Uh, I did not want to get into the thing of, okay, you get 1% or you get 2% or you get whatever uh, and, and, and uh, bait people with the possibility that, you know, that they're going to be making serious money off of a project when I cannot predict whether the movie will make money or not. So I don't want to mislead effective? people. Was it effective oh, yeah. then, because you're connecting to a charity which gives it a movie with a cause, was it effective to actually get money for the charities? Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, some with more uh, success than others. One of, the, uh, one of the most successful was we did a version of Beowulf, Beowulf, Prince of the Geats, uh, in 2007, 2008. And uh, we had aligned with the American Cancer Society. And that is probably, that raised several thousand dollars for the charity. And we've sold copies, I was on DVD, copies all around the world for that. Um, we also uh, <laughs> got a lot of notoriety from, uh, you know, major press, which helped a lot. That uh, New York Times, USA Today, Smithsonian Magazine, all did articles on us because we were doing a version of Beowulf, actually before the Robert Zemeckis version uh, was announced. And uh, actually, well, <laughs> we started ours first. We got in the Hollywood Reporter that we were doing this, and then uh, the other versions of Beowulf followed shortly thereafter. And I have heard from some friends of mine in Hollywood that um, some of those films were actually started because they heard that we were doing Beowulf, and so they wanted to do a version of Beowulf. And they did theirs with a lot more money than we had. <laughs> well, still on the topic of money, in order to produce a film, you have to have, there, there's expenses involved. You've got to be able to pay for it. So, no. as you're, how did you pay? <laughs> I mean, there's got to be some sort of expenses. Where you, do you take the expenses out of some of the funding you receive for the charities, or do you just nope. literally pass Never. on 100%? 100 percent um name something that uh would cost money we'll talk about it. <laughs> any kind of stage set creation food okay fuel costs well, uh, let's let's start with stage construction maybe you want to rent yourself um, a red for the day well i have my own camera and that started off with working at the tv station i'm a news photographer it's been my day job uh, I've done that since 76 at various TV stations around. Um, and uh, I had a trade going with the TV station uh, initially where um, I would make the movie using station equipment, station camera, station editing gear, and uh, uh, office support, copy machines, 
that sort of thing, in exchange for them being able to show the movie on their air uh, for free. And they went, yes, we'll take that. And that's pretty much how it all got, that got started. Uh, then we started, uh, I had uh, over time acquired cameras. Uh, when the station would upgrade equipment, they'd take their old cameras and they'd throw them away. Well, they, I caught them when they threw them away. I have been able to slowly upgrade my own stock of uh, camera gear and uh, I had not aligned with a movie production specifically, had gone out and gotten a Canon C100 uh, camera shooting in HD um, that, you know, it was not part of a budget of a production. It was, I want this camera. So I had the money and went out and got the camera. Um, set construction, though, uh, for Beowulf, which was the last film that we actually had to build a major set for um all of that was donated we went to we were uh as we were doing that for the american cancer society i went to a warehouse company uh nearby and uh asked you guys have any empty warehouse space that you could let us use uh as a sound stage and he said sure yeah this is for a good cause absolutely here's 7500 square feet of warehouse space wow um yeah uh, then we went and started, uh, we went to the railroad company, railroad uh, terminal here in town, and they had old uh, railroad ties, uh, the big oak 10-foot timber ties, and uh, asked them, we're doing this for charity, do you have any extras that you guys are throwing away? And they said, yeah, we've got about 64,000 pounds worth of oak railroad ties you're welcome to them if you can haul, haul them away so we took those uh we uh went to uh, uh a lot of one of the building blocks that i use for the backing of sets is uh shipping pallets skids uh so we went to some uh what was it a uh a spa dealership that sold hot tubs and they track truck in all their hot tubs on pallets more than they can use and they don't want them so they've got a stack of you know 200 pallets that are free for anybody to take if they want so we use those as the backing for sets and then we just had to put facing on it and you know we got facing donated um at one point we even went to formica corporation which is based here in uh cincinnati and asked you know we need to face some stuff with Formica, we'd like to do a Formica. Would you donate a few sheets of Formica? Sure, done. So uh, we were able to. It's like you just get you know, everybody to just give you stuff. That's really cool. Hold on one yeah. second. I'll be right back. Sure, absolutely. Hold on. Here on the show with me, Jeffrey Hill, we are always looking for new people to come on the show as a guest and share their stories. I love to talk to actors, singers, producers, filmmakers, authors, and tons of other people. If you or somebody you know would be a great guest for my show or any other shows on the network, just go to tvpbn.com forward slash the show prep and fill out the application today. I look forward to seeing you. Are you looking for ways to make more money? Are you good at sales? Do you have the drive and the ambition that it takes to get the job done? Well then come join our team here at TVPBN. We offer great incentives. Work your own hours from ever, wherever you want. Small town, big city, my favorite, the quiet island beach. It all works. Go to TVPBN.com today. Click on the link to become an affiliate. My name is Chris Mayberry, and I'm excited to be working with you. Hey, hey, hey. I'm on vacation every single day because I love my occupation. Hey. Hey. Oh, I love me some good TikTok from time to time. We're sitting here <laughs> talking to Scott Wegener about his career as a broadcast TV journalist. Camera operator, five-time Emmy Award-winning producer, 
And it's very interesting because he has found a way to connect films with money to benefit people's lives. How often do filmmakers say, how can I get funding for my film? So of course, naturally, I thought, well, he's going to take some of the funding and he's going to utilize it to pay for the film. But no, he is way more generous and way more creative than that. But there is something significant about what he's doing here, folks. He's not just taking the money for himself. He discovered that if you do charitable things, the world will donate money. So many of you are looking for a way to fund your film or a way to get a little more exposure for your film, and Scott found the way. Pull in a credible charity with you and then let them help endorse your film. I mean, that's what you did, right, Scott? Well, pretty much. A little bit of uh, detail I want to get uh, in here, uh, uh, correction. Um, we never asked for money. Never ask anybody for cash. Uh, it's always goods and services. So we never like ask, we need money to buy lumber. We go out and find lumber and get people to actually donate to lumber. And uh, we don't ask for a charity to endorse the film. Uh, we will go to a charity and say, if this movie makes money, is it okay if we write you a check and give you whatever the proceeds are? And usually they say, sure, why not? And Do they allow that's, you to use their name, though, when you go around and talk to people? We can use their name. We're not supposed to use their logo. And it's kind of a legal thing because if we start using their logo, people might think that the movie is actually being produced by that charity. And for legal reasons, if anything goes wrong on the set, they don't want to be held liable as the deep pockets that somebody's going to say, oh, well, you know, we'll just sue the American Cancer Society or Boys and Girls Clubs because they've got a lot of money. Um, so they have to keep some separation from there for legal reasons. So we can tell people that, yes, we're raising money for, you know, this charity or that charity, uh, but they don't want us to be using their logos, promoting, you know, them in, in any kind of regard like that. Uh, of like putting a commercial up or any of that sort of thing. So we've got to kind of keep the distance. The whole agreement is just if we make money, they get it. That's a beautiful situation, really. So you get to do what you love mm -hmm. and benefit people around you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the benefit isn't just with the charity. Uh, because we're doing this with zero budget, Clearly, uh, a lot of the actors, cast, crew members, sometimes they're at various skill levels. Sometimes they've got a lot of uh, experience. And sometimes, and more often than not, they're lower on the learning curve that they're just starting to get into it. And we give them that opportunity uh, to test the waters, to push themselves to their limits. And I push people pretty hard. I do it in a, a fun you know, encouraging way. But um, like if we're shooting a scene with an actor, if if they don't have a whole lot of experience, uh, it may take 40, 50 takes, literally, to get the shot that we want. Um, and we, you know, it's, it's everybody stays cool and calm. Well, let's just, let's try it again, or maybe try it this way. Uh, raise your hand over this way. You know, something that just makes it a little more comfortable for them. And uh, we've we've uh, actually started a lot of careers in, in film, either in front or behind the camera, um, because of the work uh, that they've been able to do on our productions. Honestly, that's not surprising. That's why we, we know who you are. People talk about you. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, they do. Your name comes up in the groups all the time. I mean, the, you're Scott Wegener. <laughs> if it, anybody who's cruised the Facebook groups has read your name in the posts. If they haven't, they need to be cruising the Facebook groups a lot more often. All right, that's uh, that's nice to hear. I haven't. Uh, I, I well, you're not to, looking for um, yourself, but I do know you outside of you know just the TV show here today. So you have a project mm -hmm. right now that you just returned from called the Pony Express, and I also wanted to talk to you about chasing the sheriff. What is this uh, Pony Express going on? 
Oh, I'm working on uh, a novel right now. Uh, I've uh, uh, wanted to take a break, you know, being a, a writer, producer, director, DP, coffee getter for making a feature film. It's physically, emotionally, and mentally just really taxing. And I figured I want to pull back from that a little bit. Uh, there's a story that I wanted to pursue about the Pony Express and figured, you know, it's it's uh, like writing a script, only when I'm done writing it, it's done, as opposed to finishing writing a script and then you got to make the movie. Um, so the story basically, or the, the premise is, um, the Pony Express was a very short-lived enterprise. It only lasted for 19 months. Uh, Oh, you're talking about the it, real live Pony Express. The real live Pony Express. 200 years ago or so, 150. Yeah, 160 years ago, just 160th anniversary this year of the and ending was, of the Pony Express. So the actual beginning of the Pony Express mail system in, in America and ending was the whole entire thing was only 19 months long? Yep, that's right. And it, it went bankrupt. Um, the whole proposition for the Pony Express was they wanted to get fast mail from the east to California uh, back in the 1860s uh, while they were in the process of building the telegraph. And they knew as soon as the telegraph connected from San Francisco to New York, Pony Express was out of business. And that took 19 months for them to set up the, the lines. Uh, across the country, and uh, so it. The, my interest in the whole thing is the uh, Pony Express ended the same year that my hometown, California, which is just outside of Sacramento, was founded. What what town is that? And that was called Woodland. Oh, you're from Woodland. It's about That's 20... a beautiful place. Yes, and it's just outside of Sacramento. And they established it, uh, it was founded by uh, establishing the post office uh, in 1861, which was the same year that the Pony Express ended. And I thought, wow, what a great story to be able to talk about the last rider of the Pony Express going across the United States and experiencing, you know, all the fun of, you know, action adventure of the Wild West. And then being able to link that in with the founding fathers of my hometown. Uh, and as that city was just starting to take root and thought, God, this is just, this is too much fun to not do. Absolutely. Especially because it's tied to real life history. Yes. And absolutely. especially in California, California's history was really uh, responsible for a lot of the things that we know in life today. The West was won by the people who were there in California. If, the, if, if Northern California, Southern California, if John Sutter had not created Sutter's Fort in California, everybody from uh, the Mississippi West would probably be, be speaking Spanish today. But because well, of John <laughs> Sutter in the 1840s, you know, <laughs> California is created and then of course the Pony Express, that's where it fits in the story. And, and with John Sutter, it probably would have not gone the way it hadn't if his, one of his uh, uh, employees, John Marshall, had not discovered gold in Coloma uh, in 1848. Uh, that's what launched the gold rush to get everybody to come to California. And there were so many Americans in California when it was owned by the Mexicans that the United States government said, we, we can't allow that. We've got to make California a state. And so that's uh, how that all came about was Americans on Mexican soil for the U.S. government to allow it to stay part of Mexico. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm extremely familiar with the California history. I produced over 200 films on it. Oh, wow. But we're not here to talk about me <laughs> and what I've produced here. <laughs> so... The Pony Express film, is this again connected to a charity? Uh, it's not a film, it's a novel. Oh, somehow I thought it was a film. No, it's a novel. Whoops, How did, did I not you lose get this me? memo? Just... 
Well, you are cutting in oh. and out, so I mi I do miss some of the the words from time to time. Okay, did my uh, something I just can still uh, see you? You can still see me. Okay, well, I can't see you, so I won't worry about it. If you can still see me, we're still good. I've got some weird Adobe Flash Player information page up here, so I don't really? know what's going on. That is a there we go. Strange. I got it back. Got it oh, back. Fantastic. Okay. We love it yeah, it's a novel. Series. It's uh, I'm pulling back from making movies uh, for a while just because it's it's just so t taxing. Uh, I'm still thinking about what it might be, um, but uh, this is going to probably consume me for the next at least year, if not further, to try and get this written. Well, and then afterwards, you can still produce it into a film because film is very clearly in your blood. I mean, it might be yes, taxing, but now you're going to have to get the younger guys to do most of the leg lifting. That's right, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I know some out, out here in Idaho where we're at, I know some fabulous filmmakers who would more than likely want to take you up on that. Oh, that sounds awesome. You're a bit far away, though. You're on the East Coast. Well, I'm in the middle of the country, right, right below Lake Erie. Oh, that's in right. Ohio here. See, well, that's why I took my shoes off, because it's connected to my brain, and my brain isn't really connected today. You're uh, in Ohio-ish, which, of yes. course, us uh, Western people sometimes think that Ohio and Iowa and Idaho are like the same thing. They're not. They're not the same place yeah, when I when, when I first moved here from California, I, I could not spell Cincinnati, and I had no idea where Ohio was on a map. <laughs> yeah, I still... Well, I always thought Iowa and Cincinnati was actually on the Atlantic, and then one day I looked at a map, and of course today I can't remember any of my geography. So you've <laughs> been a you've been a, a broadcast TV camera operator newsman for decades. Yes. What's the most crazy, ridiculous, ugly, obnoxious thing you have ever shot as a news camera operator? Well, boy, there's a that covers a lot of territory. Um, tell you one I fun mean, you've story. You've seen everything. You would have to, have, especially because you're in a big city. And well, as big city, small towns. Uh, you know, I started in uh, Boston, then I went to Santa Barbara, California, and then I went up to Eugene, Oregon, then down to Sacramento, and then out here to Cincinnati. Uh, so I've had a great mix of the big stuff and the little stuff. And uh, I tell you that probably the smaller markets have more. Uh, crazy news events happen uh, than the big cities. Really? I don't know exactly why that is. As an example, like what? I mean, I'm in a town of 1,400 people. The only thing that ever happens here is a cow farts. Of course, then <laughs> Greenpeace shows up, and who there else? You go. The Sierra Club from California, a, a, a cow farted. Well, seriously, what? What the heck? What could well, when I was in more? Eugene, when I was in Eugene, I'll give you a couple awesome examples there. Um, I was in Eugene in 1980. 1980, you may have heard of a uh, little mountain called Mount St. Helens. Blew its top. And, uh, I flew uh, they, over it just this morning. And uh, we uh, chartered a plane and flew towards the eruption and uh, got as close as the FAA would allow. And then four months later, after it cooled, I'm sorry, a year later, a year and four months, uh, we went back with the USGS, took a helicopter, and landed inside the crater of the volcano while it was still smoking and the lava dome was still growing. They wanted to do some tests to see if it was going to erupt again. <laughs> and like an idiot, I said, oh, can I go with? That would be really cool. So I was able to go and uh, melt the soles of my shoes walking around inside an active volcano. So you're uh, telling me that that footage from the aircraft during the main eruption of Mount St. Helens was you? There was more than one aircraft in the sky. Uh, you I were was the shooting. Closest. I well, I don't know if everybody else was, you know, getting close or not, but my footage did end up on ABC News. Uh, I was working for the ABC affiliate in Eugene, and uh, so. Uh, they took our footage and, and aired it, uh, but there were also a lot of people on the ground there. And I was not, I was in the air, so I wasn't on the ground. 
uh, uh, and you're right near up the there, vol- circling around this volcano in an aircraft. See, I remember yep. this footage because I was, I'm old enough to remember that the kaboof. Yeah, yep, absolutely. And wow. uh, you there's, see, friends, there's a million. This is why I called him a legend. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. This footage of Mount St. Helens exploding and seeing that from the aircraft, I can vividly recall this in my head. And that was yeah. you. The smoke filled the, you know, the explosion filled the whole horizon from one end of the sky to the other. It was, it was incredible. And you were the crazy schlub that got in the airplane and did all the footage <laughs> and then climbed down in the, in the, the, the cone. Wow. Yeah. And back in those days, shooting, and we were, uh, it was like the uh, shooting it, uh, 1980, we would have shot that on film. It was 16 millimeter film. And the way it was working in those days was very low tech. They literally took the door off the airplane and flew parallel to the, the crater. So I'm looking out sideways out of an open door at uh you know seven thousand feet and hanging out the door to get clear pictures of the volcano while it's uh while it's doing its thing did you at least was, stra- hold on to the seat put a seat belt on or or did osha show up and say this is unsafe shooting that was before osha seemed to get very involved in that kind of stuff and we didn't really talk about at the time what we were doing but um as i recall uh, no, I was not belted in because I couldn't get in position to shoot out the door sideways if I was belted in. You're um, just hanging your butt it, right out the window and shooting. Yeah, right out. Only there was no door. I was basically the wall of the airplane was missing, and I'm just shooting out the side of the cabin. Um, and that was common in those days. Uh, there were when I was in Santa Barbara, we'd go up in a Coast Guard helicopter. And they take the door off the side of the Coast Guard helicopter or slide it open. I can't remember which. And literally just have to hang on to the beam on the side of the helicopter standing and, and lean out the window to shoot or lean out the, the opening to shoot. Uh, and that was the way it was done back then because they didn't have FLIR cameras. They didn't have any way of mounting stuff under the nose or any of that. Uh, it was way before those that time. That's the way history is made by it's, uh, guys who have the guts to make it. Wow. It's, so, it was, what did you earn the Emmys in? What, 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 what got you all the Emmys? Uh, for uh, those, there were two films. Uh, the first one was called The Mutants, which was a children's program. It was a half hour long. Um, and uh, uh, won an Emmy for children's programming with that. Uh, that was the first exposure that I had to doing a movie for free with the TV station where I said uh, the, F- the FCC had come to all the TV stations and said you got to up the amount of local origination children's programming or your license is in jeopardy. And our general managers were scrambling to figure out how to handle that. And I went into the general manager's office and said, hey, tell you what, I'll make you a movie for free if you let me use the equipment. And he said, what do you mean free? And I said, I'll handle the actors, the production, the editing, everything involved with making the movie as long as I can use the equipment. And he said, sure, go for it. And uh, eight months later, we had a finished film. And uh, that, that took an Emmy. And then uh, a little while later, I made a movie called The Golem which was based on an old Jewish legend uh, that was actually shot by my great-great-uncle Paul Wegener in Germany in 1920. And I'd always wanted a version of that, and now I had the resources to be able to do that with the camera gear and was kind of feeling my way of networking to be able to get goods and services to build sets. So we did that movie, uh, and... It premiered on uh, the ABC in Cincinnati uh, for, during Rosh Hashanah. And uh, that earned three Emmys, one for photography, one for editing, and one for 
Wow. Uh, and and, and then I did basically free films. Yeah, absolutely. That's cool. Yeah. And then what you, you did another one for, is this related to the sheriff yeah. incident? Yes, I uh, for I never entered. You shot the sheriff, but you did. I shot, shoot the, the sheriff. <laughs> um, I never entered in the Emmys uh, for some reason. Uh, just wasn't interested in entering Emmy competition for my day job in television news. And uh, the reporter that was involved in that was saying, "We got to enter this. This is just too good." And well, okay, so we entered it, and uh, it won. It was a story about. Uh, some uh, bad things that were happening in uh, the sheriff's department in Hamilton County. And we were trying to chase down the sheriff to get him. He was at a commissioner's meeting uh, on the ninth floor of the administration building. And we tried to, you know, kind of ambush him to get him to talk. He knew we were there. It's not like we were ambushing him that he didn't know there was media in the building. Um, and because we cover the commissioners all the time. And uh, so we went up to him in the elevator uh, to ask him these questions. And rather than duck into an elevator and just close the doors and not let us in, he decided to run down the stairwell. Where he literally we could, just ran where, away. He just literally ran away. And we the chased him. With a gun on away. his hip, runs away. Yep. <laughs> and we and we circled down the stairwell nine flights with constantly I'm rolling and I'm seeing the back of his head and he's he's basically saying I have no comment I have no comment I have no comment and we went all the way down out onto the the uh, uh, sidewalk and, and and two later just chasing this guy trying to get him to make a comment and he just wouldn't do it. And, uh, you know, finally, it's like, OK, we're not going to get any more. And and we, we stopped after that. But uh, that apparently that kind of effort took notice with the Emmy people. <laughs> and I'm glad because I was kind of tired after shooting. That. <laughs> that all paid off. That's incredible, really, because, you know, the guy's got a gun on his belt and you'd be like, whoa, he could just, like turn around and just, hey, Get out of my face. I'm going to arrest you. You're harassing me or something. But that has actually, uh, that really says a lot about the freedom of the press in our country, too. It does. It does. And, you know, it's, it's still important that uh, news outlets hold officials accountable for the actions in their department, what they do. And, you know, we're basically the what is it, the, the fifth estate, the fourth estate, uh, we're the ones that have to watch all the other branches of government to make sure they're doing their jobs right and they're spending taxpayers' dollars the way the taxpayers want them to be spent. And, uh, you know, that's what we report on so they can make a decision and say, oh, well, I think they're doing a good job, let's reelect them, or they're not doing a good job, throw the bums out. Uh, we just have to give them the information so they can do that. But then today you see the fact checkers who fact check the news and we all say, well, wait a minute, this news isn't factual. Well, it seems like I don't know. Some, there's a disconnect from, I mean, you're the camera guy, you know exactly what happened, but yeah. why does it seem like there's this disconnect in news where news no longer seems to be factual, it's all based on Well, uh, I think there's a misconception. And, I think there's a misconception there where we are conflating talk shows with real news. And with the advent of MSNBC, Fox News, CNN, where they have 24 hours to fill and they don't have the staff to have news for 24 hours. So they have talk shows. They have Tucker Carlson. They have, you know, whoever, whoever Rachel is on, on MSNBC. They have lots of different talent show folks, and their job is to stir up an opinion base so people will watch and give them ratings. If you watch traditional news outlets, your local television stations, your local newspapers, or network news, you know, the alphabet, the, the traditional alphabet soup of ABC, NBC, CBS, NPR, uh, 
PBS, you're going to get the same kind of factual based news that you've always gotten. It's but people I, I've, I've had these conversations with a lot of people and they they don't understand disconnect of watching a talk show that says it's news like if it it'll be Fox News, but it's a talk show or yeah. CNN, but it's a talk show and it's it's people find it a lot easier to watch news on their phone or their mobile device. Well, you're not going to get broadcast news that easily there. You get your local paper that easily there. So they end up gravitating towards these 24 hour uh, enterprises that are mostly just opinion on both sides. I mean, it's propaganda, pure and simple on both sides for just to agitate their own base of viewers so more people will watch. But that's not journalism. So real journalism really is still alive at 10 o'clock at night and at the 11 o'clock hour when you watch your Absolutely. local news. That's Absolutely. Really, good. really, really good. And people may disagree with what they see or get upset with what they see. Uh, it happens, but that doesn't mean that it's not factual news. It's that they're disagreeing with, you know, I don't want to see that. Like if uh, we just got through with you know, June was Pride Month, and we do a lot of stories about the gay community and news that's happening with them and progress they've made and, you know, whatever that is. And a lot of people get upset saying, well, you're just the biased liberal news media because you're, you're covering the gay community. Well, that's news and it's journalism, and we need the public to realize this is what's going on in your community. We're not making stuff up. We're not, you know, uh, skewing the news if we're talking about a particular, you know, group or community. It's In just, other words, if you nowadays don't... when you show them the real news, they don't want to believe it. They don't want to hear it. Well, I don't know whether it's so much they don't want to believe it as much as they'd rather not hear it in their echo chamber of whatever, you know, they've been watching on the talk shows and they'll get into this cycle of, of no, 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 I don't want to, I don't want to hear that. That's not true. It's not true. I want alternative facts. Well, we all know in real life, there's no such thing as alternative facts, but there's people who, you know, and it, it's that way in politics. It's that way in in so many things, uh, you know, and I've had conversations with some of my brothers who like, you know, they think that climate change is all political and it's not real. It's not really happening. And it's, you know, we're giving you the facts and it's you're not listening to that. You're listening to the talk shows to make your opinion. And there's, you know, it's it's frustrating, but that's kind of the world we're living in now. I find this whole topic really fascinating because we're hearing this now, not from someone who said, my producer said I have to say this. We're hearing it from the actual guy who really shoots the actual news, that news, real news is still alive, but the public doesn't necessarily want to hear that. And I think that's fascinating. But let's go back to the, the you know, you were here to show us a movie clip of something you've got in the works. Or is it something you produced previously? I'm not really certain. We've got a movie clip here. Yeah, this is uh, 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 actually a trailer from my last feature film called The Riddle of the Spider's Web. It's a third in a trilogy of uh, uh, youth-oriented action-adventure films. Uh, let me give you a little bit of backup or background on this. Um, Originally, when I was making films for the television station, I wanted to do a film uh, showcasing or making science and education uh, fun and exciting and cool for people. Because in the school system that uh, my kids were at, there was this kind of onus that you don't want to be too smart. That you know, if you're an egghead or you know, too smart 
then you're not cool and you end up getting in a lot of fights and this, that, and the other thing. And so I wanted to make a film with uh, attractive young people who were athletic, they were smart, they engaged the world, and they had a great passion for science and engaging the world around them. And so we came up with this uh, premise of these two young college or young high school science uh, students uh, who uh, make incredible discoveries in high school and then afterwards they go on to travel the world with one of their fathers um, and get themselves into crazy uh, adventures and situations that they can only figure out and the parents aren't smart enough to figure them out. Sort of like Johnny Quest meets the Hardy Boys. Fun. I read yes, so many Hardy Boys right. mysteries when I was growing up. <laughs> so many, probably, well, well, I mean, so, I say so many like it was thousands, but if I recall at the time, back in the dark ages, I think there were like 31 books or something. But to me, that mm -hmm. just seemed like endless amounts of mysteries. I never did get into Nancy Drew, but Hardy Boys, they were the ish. Well, let's take a look Absolutely. at this clip. Let's take a look at All right. it. Martin. Do you know anyone here, Dad? I could look him up. We won't find them. They'll find us. We have family here. We do? Dark. Food. Oh, come on. Crazy teenager Robert has touched me up. Miss Dunn's gonna help keep an eye on him. She may have her hands full. Mr. Harrison does not take the babysitter. Harrison, you have a way of getting into trouble, not just some of the time, but all of the time. I'm with the guys that stole the laser. I didn't raise my boys like that. Anybody mind if I borrow this boat? something of interest. Hi. He's not fulfilling anyone's destiny. He's kidnapped. I know you very much. Working on Mark. They have to find you in my My mission is to get rid of Harrison and if I can, Dr. Scott's son. And for that, they will take me in my life. So, Philip, remember Harrison. Are you ready for immortality? Oh, what are you doing? Creating a singularity. Guys, it doesn't matter. Press the head fun I saw the part in there where the the water's going everywhere it looks like a boat was capsized or something how did you actually do that uh, that uh, <laughs> we shot that in a rainstorm uh, yeah, with what a green heck? screen yeah we That's uh, a we uh, rainstorm <laughs> Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't intentional. We had we had scheduled to shoot this scene, and we had planned on uh, basically what this, the the setup was. They they uh, have stolen a laser or re grabbed a laser that was being stolen by pirates, and uh, trying to get it off of this their pirate boat in the middle of a hurricane in the Caribbean, and uh, so things go from bad to worse, and this uh, they end up being in this motorboat that gets capsized in the middle of the storm. And uh, we had to stage kind of a fight on top of the hull of the capsized boat. And the day we were set up to shoot that, it was just supposed to be in a green screen outside where the boat was. Somebody loaned us a boat uh, to shoot with. And wouldn't you know it, 
a big old storm moves in. And so, okay, we'll just go ahead and shoot this in the rain. And it was, we were just getting pelted with this massive storm, uh, you know, hoping that lightning didn't hit the camera. <laughs> so it was real. It was supposed to be green screen, but in yeah. reality, it was a real, it was real. That's so it was cool. a real storm, but it was, we still had the green screen up, so you'd have the ocean in the background. But uh, yeah, all the rain falling on their face, that was, that was the real deal. Wow, that sure beats using the garden hose. Yeah, really. <laughs> well, this has been really fantastic, super fantastic. Something is in my eye. So I'm going to have to call it quits here because I don't know what's gone wrong with my eye. It's, 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 uh oh. Yeah, I was wiping my eye. I really appreciate you being here. You, you, you did exactly oh, what I was hoping for. You shared some nuggets, you gave some tips. So much fun to meet a guy with so many Emmys from stuff that's great. You know, it's, it's, it's beautiful. Really, really great. So much fun being here. Really, really enjoy this. This is great. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you very that. much for having me. What is your next, I've got just a little bit of time. Do you have one more thing coming up in the future? Because I know you're writing your book, but surely with film in your blood, can you really go an entire year without shooting another fun film? Well, it'll probably, it, it takes five years to make a movie. So, uh, because I'm doing it in my spare time with no money, that time is what, what the element is. I am working on, I'm trying to check on the idea of doing an animated film next. Ooh, uh, I've got a guy you ought to talk to. Okay. Yes, he was on the oh, show the other to... day. He is a stop uh -huh. motion animator. Ooh. Awesome guy. His name is Hut Wiggly. I'll give Hutt his contact Wiggly. info. Yes. That's a great animation name. And he's a great animator. Great. All right. Well, thank yes. you very much. It's been a pleasure. And uh, yeah, everybody have a have a great week. Thank you. Thank you. Folks at home. You learn some tips. Those of you who love filmmaking, watch this twice. He said some stuff. If you really think about it, really listen to it, you're going to say, man, that answered my question because we see all those questions on Facebook and sometimes they drive us insane. And, and maybe you're a, a young filmmaker wondering, how am I supposed to do this? I love film, but no one seems to care. Or, or whatever your question is, Scott said some stuff today that solve problems. After 50 years of being in the filmmaking industry, filmmaking world, the whole hobby, as both as a professional and as a hobbyist, you got to go back, play the whole episode again, and learn. Until next time, I'm Jeffrey Hill, and I love you all.